All right, our first panel is titled AI for Detection and Incident AI Response. Our moderator is Scott Shimmerman, and he will introduce the rest of the panelists. Thanks. Everybody have a good time last night? <laughs> what a great audience we have here in New York City at an AI conference. 15 years ago, how many people thought they would be attending a conference like this on this topic? Not very many of us, correct? <laughs> so um, how many people watch Netflix? Show of hands. OK, a lot of you. OK, Netflix probably knows what you're going to want to watch three years from now in ways you'll probably never understand yourself better than you do. Weird. How many people watch Games of Thrones? Game of Thrones, right? Mm -hmm. All right, isn't it like Game of Thrones that has the master algorithm for what everybody wants to watch? They've cracked the code. That's amazing. <laughs> a few other things to warm us up. Turn to the person next to you and say, I love AI. I love AI. Um. <laughs> <laughs> or don't, <laughs> but mean it whatever you say. <laughs> and finally, turn to the person next to you and say, I don't know what AI is. Oh, mm. yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> Even the, even the data scientists among us will probably agree. <coughs> Speaking of data scientists, how many data scientists do we have in the room? Other than you all, some of you all. <laughs> how many? Is that probably three or four people? And how many people are in cybersecurity in general? OK, most of us. OK. That ratio is an interesting one, and we'll explore that in a little bit. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm Scott Shefferman. I'm with Silence. I'm here to moderate the panel. It's all about these amazing gentlemen here. Um, well, I got to speak to them earlier uh, in the week, a couple weeks ago where it was, and that was probably one of the most amazing uh, 35 minutes of warm-up I've ever had for a panel, prior to our panel. So we have some very smart, experienced, and diverse um, panelists today. Uh, and on that note, I will let them introduce themselves, starting with you, and go right down the line uh, and end with uh, one funny thing about you. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get prepped for that. <laughs> uh, so my name is Dustin Hillard. I'm the CTO at eCentire. Uh, my background is a PhD in machine learning for speech and natural language understanding. So I started there and uh, worked in advertising and uh, at Yahoo and natural language understanding at Microsoft before starting uh, Versive, which was a startup where we were trying to build a platform uh, to solve all machine learning problems and didn't quite get there. So we focused in on cybersecurity. So for the past uh, few years, uh, that's been uh, what I've been focused on, is how to do behavioral <coughs> understanding on networks and understand malicious behavior. And so we were acquired by eCentire last fall, and so that's where I am now and working on that. Something funny about me, uh, I have a one-year-old that's just started walking, and so I, I never sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how funny. That's good. Uh, Raphael Marty, I run re um, research and intelligence for a company called Forcepoint, which some of you might know. Um, what um, we're focusing on is really transitioning sort of away from the traditional threat intelligence and IOC-based work that we do in cybersecurity to more a behavioral-based approach, understanding how can we characterize human behavior and then detect <coughs> outliers from there. I have spent my whole career in cybersecurity, started in academia, always sort of on the defense side doing data analytics in cybersecurity. Back then, we didn't call it big data or AI. It was just data and statistics. I'm not really sure what's different today, um, but we'll explore that on the panel, I'm sure. Um, something funny about me, um, I'm not sure if it's funny, but don't get in my way. Uh, I used to be a semi-professional target shooter, so. Uh. <laughs> so I'm Mark Sherman, and you heard uh, part of what we do, which is about building secure software, uh, most of us not with AI. But in, in this kind of context, I think we represent a slightly different group in that uh, we've assembled, my team has assembled, a large number of statisticians, uh, people who, when they walked in the door, didn't know anything about cybersecurity. That's because we have a couple hundred other folks at the Institute who know a great deal about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, to the point made earlier, they spend their time partnering with them on all sorts of things, insider threat, malware analysis, data, uh, debt flow analysis, <coughs> program analysis, uh, in order to apply uh, good statistical techniques and good math into the cybersecurity problems. Uh, and the only thing that I will say is my uh, grandkids came to visit, and I enjoy one of the best prerogatives of a grandparent in saying it's time for them to go home with their parents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Sam Curry. Um, I've been in security for 27 years. Uh, I'm a physicist and a linguist by training. I used to do cryptanalysis. Uh, I did two startups, but I held senior roles at McAfee. Computer Associates. I was CTO at RSA and ran RSA Labs. I, I started to do machine learning in a security context around fraud uh, 12 years ago. Um, 
And that was eye-opening, um, probably highly relevant to today. And then, obviously, during the RSA breach, uh, we started to try to apply that exact same technology to detecting more advanced attacks. Um, and it's proved to be very difficult, but also fruitful when you can make it work. Um, and uh, currently, I'm the chief security officer for Cyber Reason. I'm Giora Engel, VP of Product Management in Palo Alto Networks. Um, originally a cyber warfare expert and uh, data scientist. And uh, uh, before Palo Alto, I uh, founded a company called Light Cyber, mm -hmm. uh, which is behavioral analytics. And uh, we got acquired by Palo Alto. Excellent. Well, as you can tell, we have quite a phenomenal panel. And uh, let's start with one of the questions we just ended up with. What is AI? A couple other things. What is AI versus ML from a marketing FUD, and also realistic perspective. Um, that's probably enough just to start us off. And I'm going to actually moderate this, because we could sit here on this question for a solid hour. It would be extremely entertaining, trust me. Uh, but we're going, to, we're going to spend not too long on it. So um, anybody who wants to start, we're not going to do anything formal here. This is casual. This is a conversation. Uh, and if any of you have anything you want to interject any, any way through, just speak up. It's all about you guys. Yeah, yes, so I'll, I'll throw something out, and then we can riff off it, right? Okay, so uh, I think the biggest thing is, is understanding the difference between ML and AI. Um, I, lo I liked your question about I don't know what's changed. I think the marketing has changed. <laughs> That's the big thing. So, so uh, computers are, are not very original. They follow instructions very well. We know this in the world of random, you know, DRBG, right? D Deterministic random bit generation is an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> it's hard to make machines be original. Uh, most of our programming is a priori. You, you say, do instruction X, do instruction Y, et cetera. Um, machine learning says that rather than just being deterministic, based on real world feedback or an environment, there are many algorithms for this, the behavior of the application can change or adapt. That, so if that makes sense to you, and uh, you can do a quick Google searches while you're in the audience, we won't be offended. You can, if you don't know them, you can look up a lot of these. A lot of them have existed for a long time. We're just at a point now where we can, at scale, apply it um, to large data sets and to really great feedback loops. It works really well with very few variables and large data sets for learning or learning sets. AI is different. AI is the pursuit of cognition, an emulation of cognition or parts of cognition, of which machine learning is one tool of many. So if I did an analogy, if I could say that carpentry is a tool used in building houses. Right? That doesn't mean that because you use carpentry that you can call it house building. Right? So ML does not equal artificial intelligence. Machine learning does not equal artificial intelligence. There are many toolkits in the pursuit of that. And we may or may not want AI. Um, and I don't, not because of any scary you know, HAL 9000 Skynet <laughs> stuff or, or fears of, of artificial intelligence taking over. There's a spectrum of intelligence that we try to emulate from insects in theory to higher intelligence forms. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily put humans right at the end of it or security analysts right at the end of it. So excellent. Um, hopefully that helps as a level set. And these guys might want to add in. I think I agree with that, right? Um, and I usually say AI doesn't exist in the sort of traditional word, the, sen uh, the sense of the word, right? Intelligence. Like we have no intelligent machines out there in no yeah, field. Yeah, we haven't passed the Turing right? test yet. Yeah. Exactly, right? Even in other fields, right, there's very smart algorithms, things that help us. But we're nowhere near where we need to be or we want to be. Um, and as you said, right, like there's, there's so many different approaches to that we today call artificial intelligence. And generally, in, in a conversation, I will just use AI as sort of a synonym to analytics. right? And it has everything from NLP to the things you mentioned. Um, and what I really like this morning, actually, in a couple of the keynotes is that the term expert knowledge was mentioned mm -hmm. a lot. right? And I think that's actually really key to the conversation here, where artificial intelligence maybe at some point, right, however far in the future. But what we really need to focus on is how do we leverage expert knowledge? How do we augment the human and capture that knowledge in the systems? And that's really, I think, what, what a lot is about today. Excellent. Yep. So already the conversation is spreading from what is AI to why is AI and all, all the good stuff. So if we get it right, we'll drop the word artificial, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's actually a good point. I laughed at first, and I processed, then I yeah. realized, I acknowledged. Yes, good. What else? So I tend to use a behavioral kind of approach, excuse me, which I was mentioning before, uh, which is the one I grew up with, which is that AI is something that looks like it can do a particular uh, skill, 
at the level a human would go. And frankly, I think that uh, if you ever use the symbolic mathematics systems, they're a whole lot better than most of the mathematicians that are out there right now, <coughs> just to pick a, a concrete example. So there are things like that. Uh, machine learning is something else, but machine learning is in my opinion, a technique usually equated with neural nets of some kind or another. Um, you can argue philosophically whether it should be or not, but I think in, in, the, in the minds of most people, they are the same. Uh, but it's not necessarily a simulation of how people think. It's a different way to reach conclusions. And the example I use is that uh, I have, as I mentioned, my grandkids. Uh, I have a grandson. I have a cat. My grandson has not seen a million cats. My cat has not seen a million babies. When they saw each other, they knew exactly what to do. So, <laughs> Algorithms. <laughs> Actually, speaking of algorithms, that's a great way to open up the conversation, too. Um, we talk about algorithms all the time. There's only a few data scientists that raise their hand. I doubt all of us truly understand what an algorithm is and why it is. And we shouldn't care most of the time, I would say. Right? <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think a part of the problem with marketing <clears throat> hype today is that we say AI first and not the problem we're solving. Yes. And so being clear about mm -hmm. what we're trying to accomplish, I think, is a lot of how we need to reorient our thinking and saying, this is the problem we're going to solve, and this is our efficacy on that. Right? And so we're starting to get to that point, I think, with some problems today. And so like general intelligence with AI definitely uh, isn't there yet. But scoped, scoped intelligence, I think we're starting to see some tasks. Or like on speech recognition, can even start to say that there's superhuman performance You know, if you compare the average human to a system that does it at scale. And that's the kind of opportunity we have is that these systems can accomplish it at scale and not get tired. Right? And so they can go through terabytes of data that a human could never uh, accomplish. Uh, but they can start to distill it down to tasks we can act on. There's a really important differentiation um, <clears throat> I'd like to flag, which is uh, a chaos systems, right? So there's, there's two types of chaos systems. The first order chaos is uh, doesn't matter what you do, it's going to behave the same way. Mm. And most of the risk we deal with in business, most of the systems that we, we train using ML uh, or algorithms, um, we're dealing with the, that kind of system. The storm doesn't care how you hide from it. It doesn't change its path, okay. right? Uh, however, a second order chaos system changes its behavior based on what you do, meaning it adapts to you. So crime is like that. Where you put police officers on street corners affects where the robberies or the muggings happen. In those cases, some of these algorithms can overlearn and become predictable. Right? So one of the problems that we have that we really want to solve is in all of IT, almost everything we fight is a nature first order chaos problem. It's root cause analysis to find a failed part bad supply chain, some you know, critical failure somewhere. And if you get better at it, you can tune it and you can get to the five nines. It's all about pushing the nines out, right? In security, after you do the basic blocking and tackling, it's frustrating <laughs> because you know, you're, you're trying to play whack-a-mole under a blanket. It's moving around and you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And so after a certain point, if you try to create the Uber algorithm to solve this, humans will get around it, the most intelligent machine that we know of um, for applied problem solving is the human being, and they're our adversary. Mm -hmm. So we would love to have an AI that can adapt to that and better, right. but we're not there. And some of the ML that we deploy winds up making us predictable and ironically more vulnerable. We see that in our own industry all the time, as uh, in the vendor space that we're in all the time, they're, they're finding ways around the AI, either directly mathematically or Around, way around. That's right, <laughs> right? that's right. And, and by the way, in other systems where you have an intelligent opponent, like markets and legal conflict, mm. um, people will adapt if they know what your behavior is going to be. Mm. But, but is it really that much of a problem of the AI, or is it more of a problem of how we use it? Yeah, and, absolutely. And I'm using AI, just like the ladder, like, yeah. analytics, whatever, right? And I think that's the problem, how we're using it, because I think we're stuck in a way of doing cybersecurity <coughs> the last 20 years. Like someone asked, like, how has it changed in the last 20 years? It's like, not much, right? If I'm facetious, it's like really not that much. No. We're still spending trillions of dollars solving a problem, but there's breaches all over. But we're still stuck in the same way of trying to characterize the bad behavior and playing the cat and mouse game, mm. right? The new exploit comes out, we're trying to find <coughs> it, build a bigger wall, the guys climb the wall again. How do we break out of that, right? How do we? Well, you, I think that? you hit on it earlier when you looked for an, an alternate definition of, of the A in AI. Uh, I, I like assisted intelligence because there is intelligence in, sec in security. It's just carbon-based, not silicon. Yeah, the are. problem is humans can't go at scale and reproducibly without getting bored or error coming in. Mm. What we really want to do is to use these algorithms to, uh, to help humans do their job better 
and look at the business outcomes. I, I liked your emphasis of problem. Let's look at the results we want mm -hmm. and use all these tools to, to tune it better over time and watch out for those blind spots. I, I want to re reinforce that because that's a point that I think is worth making, that people tend to think of AI or ML systems as um, a ton of, uh, no, automation to replace humans where the most successful applications have been when it's been used to augment humans. To give uh, a public example, um, everyone knows about uh, the chess programs that uh, beat uh, all the, the grandmasters at chess. But it turns out they've had further tournaments in where uh, the participants could be any combination of people, you know, teams of people, grandmasters, just machines. And it turns out the winner was good, but not spectacular players, running uh, several chess programs on PCs that together the combined augmented uh, talent between the two uh, blew away the rest of the field. And in a more, uh, more targeted thing to this conference, uh, for example, in our, in our system, I mentioned that we have um, statisticians working with ML, uh, uh, sorry, working with the cyber folks. Uh, we've developed techniques by which we can extract and, for example, show pictures of what's going on with malware. And from those pictures, based on what the cyber analysts say is interesting to see, they can actually look at that and say, I understand what that piece of malware is now doing. I recognize that these three are from the same family. I recognize that this is a MIPS malware versus an Intel malware, and so on. By itself, the program, the, the, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence program, the software, is not capable of doing that. And the human by themselves is over, can do it, but it's, it's an entirely uh, tedious task and very low productivity. But together, um, it's being deployed in the usual places that you might imagine that malware gets analyzed. That's a great, yeah, super great. Yeah. I think uh, an important point is that uh, uh, we, we used the ML for many years for characterizing threats and malware. And I think it's very important for the vendor side to, to automate that process because there's so much badness out there and you know, we need to, to automate that. Uh, but I think in recent years, there is uh, more and more use of AI and machine learning uh, to actually characterize the, the normal behavior or uh, what's, what's normal for the organization and how, if we understand the normal, how we can find abnormalities. And I think this is a, you know, this is a bit of, of a newer field and, and it works more for the customer rather than for the vendor. Uh, so that's maybe a, you know, a different way of using, uh, using these algorithms. It, and I guess my point is it all depends on uh, what problem we're trying to solve. And you know, to, solving uh, vendor problems is also important because the vendors end up you know, providing the products. Uh, but uh, different pro uh, problems require different algorithms. I, I would caution, by the way, about patterns that solve things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they all have a shelf life. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's really a few factors that around that. One is, over time, bad guys try to look like good guys, mm. right? Uh, number two is good guys actually start looking like bad guys. Mm. And, and that may sound strange, but th there's nothing made in, in computer science that's inherently good or bad. You develop a technique, and everyone employs it. We saw this with key loggers. We used to say if it shimmed the keyboard drivers, it was inherently a key logger until all the instant messaging apps said, no more pinwheel or hourglass of doom. You can still instant message while your machine is hung. Uh -huh. Right, so they started to shim the keyboard and go directly to it. That starts to look bad, yeah. and it's good behavior. All false positives got triggered in all the AB products about 15 years ago as a result. And, and also, over time, networks become just follow Moore's law and Gilder's law and what have you, although that didn't work out. Um, you'll see that behavior will become more complex over time. Forget increasing the size of a network. If you leave it alone, people find new uses for it. Yeah. So those good idea, but then go back and test and make sure that it's still valid because it has a half-life. Good. But I think this is also coming back to the comment I made earlier about <clears throat> cybersecurity, how we're stuck, right? And I think we're still in a world where we're making zero-one decisions. Either you're allowed to do it or you're not. Mm -hmm. Slowly, I'm seeing solutions out there that get into the space of maybe a risk-based approach to say, you know what, this machine here now, I see it has higher risk. Let's take action based on that higher risk and maybe allow it to still browse the internet but not letting it go to my critical business files anymore. And so if, I, if we go there, I think we have an opportunity to open up and, and start using things like you just mentioned, right, of, of sort of saying, well, what is the normal behavior? And we don't always have to say, like, this is exactly how Rafi works in the network, right? It can just be like, well, these are the things he generally does and these he doesn't. Like, I barely ever scan the whole network, right? This is the overemphasis of authentication over authorization. That's because right. uh, 
For years, we, we've, we've put all the burden on authentication. Just trust you to be you. Time. Yeah. And then we're not going to do the authorization thing properly. Mm -hmm. um, where really, we should be doing much more adaptive and, mm -hmm. and qualified authorization decisions at scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's plenty of applications potentially for ML there. Part of what you guys are mentioning actually feeds into one of the things we spoke about a little bit on the call, which was um, how important context is. It was taken as a broad term, but also uh, bringing it back to a cybersecurity practice, uh, we as human hackers and analysts and everything else, we've always said context is everything when we're doing incident response, when we're doing malware analysis even. A anything you're doing, context is everything. Um, it seems like it's also important for two machines, not just humans. Is that correct? Definitely. And I think part of the challenge in security that we've asserted is that there's this asymmetry and that uh, attackers have the advantage because all they have to do is find the one hole. But I think we can flip that asymmetry because we have the ability to instrument and understand our own environments and networks, right? And so building up exactly that context and that situational awareness mm -hmm. and giving our teams and defenders the capability to understand why is this happening. And then I think you can start to do these more gradated responses, right? In this case, we should ask for an extra authorization right. because it's a little bit of risk here. And in that, in that case, we have to wipe the machine because uh, you know we understand how severe the outcome is. But starting, I think, to switch to building situational and context awareness yeah. um, of your internal network is can really change and give we have the data, we have the advantage in the context where a, an attacker now has to subvert that and blend in, right? And they have to have the same amount of data to actually blend in. But so do we actually that. have the data? We, need, we, we, <laughs> we, we can, right? So I think that's uh, part of where we have to start going. It's, it's, it's non-trivial, but you're right. I mean, yep. you want info context, you want identity context, but yep. uh, where, where Rafi was going, um, I think it's, it's really important to try to bring some of that to bear. But we, back in the banking days, the assumption was every PC has malware on it. I still have to bank with them. Mm -hmm. So how do, I, how do I pick and choose which functions can be done by which users, mm -hmm. knowing that there's malware or even a Trojan on that system? Mm -hmm. and, and when you try to solve that problem, you get less into the yes, no question. If in the an enterprise context, it's re-image it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's yeah. infected. Bring yeah. it in. Well, expensive, but we'll send you a, a loaner, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. But in banking, they can't do that. Yep. So they were said, I still need to be able to let that person do a transfer or pay a bill. So that's partly uh, feeds into the AML aspect, too, just the assumed adversarial context that anything we're doing in cybersecurity has, by definition, because we have adversaries. Um, how, what other ways, like currently in our field, are, are we or are we not seeing AML being used to actually attack machine learning and AIs directly on the rather than around? Side. What's that? The adversary side? Yes. So we're just seeing automation. But we have to infer what they do for the most part. Um, Still. We, hear, we do see some tools occasionally pop up, and we do see evidence of large-scale feedback, mm -hmm. right? Um, certainly when they select targets. So mm -hmm. for instance, a lot of the cyber criminals at the moment are saying um, they, they have a human operator with a finite bandwidth. They want better quality, more developed uh, attacks for them to spend their time on, go three or four stages deep, mm -hmm. give them a triaged queue based on things like naming, mm -hmm. on which systems are more likely to be more valuable for which purposes they have. So we, we definitely see the result of that, but it's mostly automation I've seen. Right. Yeah, I agree. So, which so, equals speed and velocity to, to the attacker's advantage. Okay. I think there's two elements to the answer. Um, the first one should come as no surprise, which is they read the same journals that the White Hats do. Mm -hmm. So everything that gets published in Las Vegas, everything that gets published in the you know, IEEE uh, Security well, the Privacy ones. They Conference. read the good, they read the good journals. <laughs> <laughs> they, read, they read the ones that they can actually use, which is, yeah. um, but they do. Uh, and in fact, um, there's a, a bit of intelligence out there that says, in some sense, the United States is behind because the Chinese hackers know English, and we don't know Chinese. So they read everything that we have, and we can't read everything that they have. Uh, so that's one particular answer. The other answer is you know, we have researchers, public and, and not so public, working in this area. Um, it is reasonable to assume, based on just technical capabilities, that the bad guys also have these kinds of talent available to them. And to the extent that we are inventing something, we should not necessarily think of ourselves as so unique and so spectacularly better than everybody else that they are not able to, to have similar kinds of things waiting to be used. OK, so we've, we've gotten right to the point of conversation where I'd, I anticipate finding some more disagreement. You guys have been way too aligned for our <laughs> case. You guys agree? Um, given all your different perspectives, let's talk about um, whether adversarial machine learning and, and broader risks of using AI, the dangers, the risks. Um, uh, is, it, is it all FUD? Is, is, it, is it brass tacks real? 
what are, what are your, I'm going to leave it fairly open and then obviously the, the conversation will cater itself, but is, you know, a lot of us hear about AI and the next thing we hear about is, oh, all the, all the FUD around it, right? Or is it, should we be even more concerned than we are? I, I don't know. I, maybe I'll try to disagree here. <laughs> um, I think there is adversarial AI is out there, right? Or ML, whatever, in whatever field. There is definitely ways. I think you showed some things, right? Like with adding some kind of noise to images, and suddenly it's something else. There's there's all these different things. Um, the question to me is really like, is it really used in the in the wild, and does it really matter that much to us? Of course, if I have a very sophisticated attacker, um, they can do all kinds of things. They can try to figure out how we actually learn. Um, I mean, one of the most common places where ML is used at large scale in the cybersecurity industry is in malware detection, right? Like we have 400,000, 500,000 new malware samples every day that we feed into a system, we learn um, the new characteristics from there, build new models, deploy them, and have a new AV signature or a new AV model, basically. Um, so you could think that maybe you inject some bad stuff in there, but good luck inserting 500,000 like pieces of malware, you actually really change the algorithm so significantly and actually learns on that. Sure, you can, you can try, you can, you can probably succeed, but there's probably easier ways to go after the population you want to go after, right? And as you mentioned, Sam, it's, it's, I think a lot of it is the automation, right? Like adversarial AI or ML, interesting, potentially for very sort of sophisticated attackers, they might want to go in and be very surgical, but I think most of these guys, especially in, in the crime area, they want to make money. They're not going to spend hundreds of hours of researching stuff. They just go automate and try wherever it works, and they make their buck there, right? So mm -hmm. they invest heavily in automation. And I think what you said is interesting, right? Like understanding which targets to hit, because it costs them as well. So if they can figure out, hey, I'm just going to go after this population here rather than this one over here, that's pretty simple for them to, to uh, sort of make yeah. their money. Uh, and so I'll build on that a bit. Um, there's asymmetry in the tools and techniques and, a and machine learning algorithms used on both sides. Okay. And one of the hardest problems is getting the business to understand what the heck we're doing in security. Hmm. So I'll give you a really concrete example. A British bank was suffering with a solution I had years ago. It's not one of mine anymore. Um, about 100 to 150,000 pounds a month of loss. That, that was a good thing. That was, only point, that was only one basis point of loss. Mm. And they had been using this for three or four years, watching the fraud come down. Um, and they said, OK, so what value are you providing for the you know, three million pounds a year that we pay you? Mm -hmm. right? So they said, we're going to turn the system off, because they didn't understand the inner workings of the box. And the next month was 1.5 million pounds of loss. And then it climbed. Mm. It went higher and higher. By the third month, they accused us of hacking them. <laughs> yeah. So what had happened, because we didn't understand what was being done on the dark side, we could just do feedback loops based on the data that we saw. By the way, our even management at this bank didn't understand what we did. We had to do a week of executive learning into what machine learning was, because the, the entire cycle of business is, you know, fool me once, right? Shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Therefore, I write hard rules to never let it happen again. Well, those create blind spots for machine learning. Mm. Those, those corrupt the feedback loop. Mm. And they were like, well, I had fraud come from Turkey for this amount of pounds, so I want to write a rule for that. And we're like, sorry, the, you're going to make your ML less effective. They didn't understand it. By the time we were done, after a week workshop, yeah. they understood. Because mm. um, the bad guys were doing tests. Okay. So they would move like a swarm to where it made sense. They didn't need to know machine learning was being used. It's like, bank A, I don't make money. Bank B, I do make money. So the swarm moved. The perception was nothing is happening to us. We're seeing that now in like uh, finance uh, attackers moving over from uh, PCI and credit carding data over to like gift carding just because they yeah. know the breach notification laws are different. Oh, Adaptive. What right. happens in your head is irrelevant. All we care about is the results on both sides. Okay. And unfortunately, that can lead to gross misunderstandings of what the tools are, what the other people do. I had someone say, well, they don't know we, we've turned off the machine learning, so and they don't know, you know what machine learning techniques we're using. Therefore, I'm like, that has nothing to do with it. They have enough wherewithal they can spend a few pounds here and there on different techniques and different targets and then move the swarm as, accordingly. It's optimizing revenue for them in so, the case of cybercrime. So you're, you're actually indirectly in, in getting towards one of the places I know we want to cover for the audience, which is um, 
when it comes time to leveraging AI, whether you're doing it internal with a data science team, which few organizations are privy to be able to have those, um, or you're talking to a vendor, what are the right kinds of questions and criteria, metrics, provability that you want to engage with with, with any AI vendor or person across from you internally? Look, it never let, I'll let everyone here answer this, but never let anybody end the conversation with because machine learning. <laughs> yeah, right? I think I think uh, one of the lessons that uh, you know I, I saw in, uh, in many customer cases is that every vendor says that uh, they're doing machine learning, and, and it's true. Let's believe ev everybody. Everybody's doing machine learning. It's like saying that we we do some programming or or, some, <laughs> or you know run something in the cloud. Um, so, so everybody does that. The question is again, what problem do you solve, and who is the analyst? Who's doing the machine learning? And I, I think there's a big difference between cases where you buy some technology that does the machine learning for you and gives you the conclusions, which in that case, you need to have analysts that go through the data. Again, if you don't have the analyst, it doesn't do anything for you. Mm. Uh, and between other cases where the vendor is actually leveraging machine learning, and uh, you don't need to even know what, what machine learning or you know, how they use it, because you're just benefiting from, uh, uh, you know, from the vendor knowing about malware. Um, or the, the third category is if, if you have these data scientists, then the, the actual customer or the end user is, is doing the machine learning and the vendor is just providing tools. Uh, so so th these are maybe three distinctions that uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's most important to start there and understand what you need. And after you know that, you can, you can uh, you know, go one step further and understand what type of product. So I do want to disagree with that because you want some yeah. conflict. Let's do so it. It's respectful. Um, <laughs> but but the, the, we're in, in security, we're not supposed to trust. We're supposed to trust and verify, right? Yeah. So um, a mechanical Turk could achieve the results often. How's it going to do under stress? How's it going to do at scale? How's it going to do with? So understanding for repeatability and predictability in boundary conditions is important. So my advice is I call it double click twice. No. If somebody says machine learning or AI, at the end of a sentence, you say, that's nice, right? Cover everything that he said, but then say, so what kind are you using? And how are you training it? Uh, but I, 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 I just have to say, guys, we need to know how that works. But, but I disagree with that one. Okay. As the customer, I have no way to understand what you just told me, that you're going to use convolutional networks with this, that, the other, boosting here, there. I don't know. What we need to come up as an industry is ways to measure how well these systems work. What's the efficacy, right? Because we, say, take firewalls. We had them for many, many, even decades. And we have independent tests out there. We're pretty good at understanding how good is a firewall. I can, we can put up a test. There's independent testing houses. And you can say, look, these are pretty I don't, I well don't, tested. Right? I how don't do think we do we're doing enough? I don't think we're giving enough credit to the end users. And if they're not ready for it, I have never, I've never uh, been able to get to, uh, in an hour meeting to spend, I've always been able to spend 10 minutes and four slides. That's it to be able to say, let me tell you about the machine learning just two levels deep. I don't expect you to be a data scientist, okay. I, I, and, it, and I'm not going to wow you with, with too much, but if it's a boosted random forest or a naive Bayesian analysis or a neural network, this stuff, some of these algorithms existed for over 100 years. Some of them have been around 30, 40 years, some more. The, this stuff, I believe, is inherently understandable, and, and, I, and I would encourage all the side people in the audience to say, I'm not a dummy. I mean, we can disagree. Yeah. I'm not a dummy, but just tell me what it is, and I but, can do a little research. You don't have to be an expert. Okay, so, but somebody you, else. Maybe a, li side, maybe a little variant to that. There we go. I think that it's important to ask the question, but maybe more focus on uh, how does it work to solve my problem? And I think if the vendor cannot explain you how, how does it work to solve your problem, then the machine learning is not relevant for you. It's, it's some, you know, something okay. so in the cloud, here. something in the product, something in the, on the vendor side. Uh, if you can understand how it can solve you, uh, the, your problem, even if you don't understand God, the algorithms, I think, you, I think that's, a, that's a good step. I think one path to that is can you explain the results, right? So independent of what algorithm you're using, like that, that can be an important part of just validating the vendor is not completely full of it. But when they present a result and they, you know, I think the canonical example is a black box that spits out a score of 88. And you're like, OK, great, that's severe because you told me anything above 80 was severe, right? But that, it should be rationalized and explained in the context of what an analyst can get that score and say, and here's the top three reasons why, right? Based on an understanding of how malicious it was, what's happening in your environment. So I think being able to justify your answer and, and show your work is a big part of it. But what you just said is, as an analyst, when I see there's an 80, yeah. I want to understand 
these are the contributing factors to it, right? Yep. I came from China, which I never come from. I have a new browser agent string. I come out at a weird hour of the day. Underneath that, I don't care how the heck you came up with that. Yep. I don't yep. care what algorithm you use. Yep. I want the explainability on a security level. I, yep. think that's, I agree with that. Yeah. Does anybody okay. disagree with, the, with that last point? Is, is it important for the customer to understand that? I think it's a, it's a fair and open question to ask. So I would, I would, I would, again, I'm a very behavioralist kind of person, and I would sort of separate the customers into different classes. Uh, but the, at the top level, the answer is no. I buy a piece of software to do accounting or cybersecurity or whatever, and it should implement you know, the FASB rules or whatever in order to, to make that happen. And so what should I do? Um, I should actually try to put whatever it is that I want to purchase into some kind of uh, environment that simulates whatever it is I want to get done and see if it behaves and provides me the value that I'm looking for. Uh -huh. The challenge is that for uh, a large company, they can afford to do that. Mm. Um, the government can go even further in some of the agencies because they have enough resources to you know, partially build or even spec it out. Right. I think the bigger challenge is once you move out of the Fortune 500, you start moving down, you get into the SMBs, you get into the critical infrastructure, you know, how many water companies are going to have you know, enough staff to even carry out the testing exercise? <laughs> I think that's much more of a challenge. And uh, in that case, they may have to go into some kind of service model. And I don't know how they together can trust the service model itself. It's just a, so it's an economic kind of question. But I will then make the one pitch I have as to what should people do, because part of what we're here for is to ask people to, to do some things. I mean, you're not going to crack open most of these boxes and take a look and try to screw around with the algorithms in them, um, especially for the smaller guys. Uh, most of these systems work better with more data. And I'll put on my sort of helping DHS hat here. Um, <laughs> DHS. Uh, puts a lot of processes in place for people to share their data. So if you have cybersecurity systems you're putting in place and they're generating information about what they see, if you can send that into, there's something called ISACs, there's other ways of doing it, there's standards like sticks and taxi and so forth, by which you can get the information aggregated and then let the guys who have the resources to actually do the analysis that you can't afford to do, to start feeding back to you some of the information. Let me ask the audience, how many people show hands are involved or using or leveraging an ISAC in their industry? That's not enough. We it, all need it, to be raising it, our it hands. May, it may vary drastically by industry. Yeah, well, some it, are good. It absolutely some are does. Not. But just in, right to your point, like in general, if one company is benefiting from AI, even if it's a large mega enterprise that has a team of data scientists solving for something in their vertical, we're all better off by sharing that data. Do we all do we agree with that in general as, a, as an industry? Is there any any no. dangers to that, or is there any reason why we, we don't want to share the output of, of our efforts? Guys, there were reasons, and the uh, largely around liability, but they're not the only ones. They were just the ones up front that hid the others. Yeah. I think we're right now in a uh, when you share in a, in a hub and spoke, that's fine. There's too much emphasis on everybody gets everything, mm. and it all has to be symmetric. Mm. Uh, I think we can asymmetrically share information. We can create hubs that do mining okay. and tell us pairwise where we have to connect much more efficiently. Instead of 50 people having to share and have 50 times the data each individually would have, it could be done more efficiently. And it gets interesting, and all these rules break down when you go down market, because I think that was a critical point in the previous question. When you go to smaller companies, they're not going to have massive, huge data sets of everybody else's data, right? So um, I, I think we need to figure out as a community how to get much more effective and share information rather than just hordes of data. I don't care how many failed logins all my peers have. Right? I care about what that meant to them. Mm -hmm. And if it matches with mine, there's a, a set of, um, uh, set of academic uh, documents and ex explorations of <laughs> privacy enforcing mutual disclosure. How do you get a Venn set and share just the overlap, but nothing else, because that's a breach. Right. right. And there are ways of doing that with HSMs and shared services and asymmetric sharing. And not enough of that is being explored. It's all motherhood and apple pie, like sharing is good. And, it, right. and it's also the, it's not enough. the quality of the data in the end, right? Because, yeah. I mean, there, have, there are examples of sharing communities, say, in Germany, the DAX 30, the, the largest 30 yeah. companies, they have a very, very good sharing network. It's all automated based on sticks and taxi and all that stuff. But what they found is that the, the quality of the IOCs that they actually exchanged was just not good, right? There was one of the many that shared really, really high quality uh, IOCs, and they spent a lot of time. They have a big SOC and all these processes. And they're like, great, we're sharing all these amazing data, and we, we get back 
just noise that we now have to verify. And so, so how do you, we're coming back full circle on this efficacy conversation, right? Like how do you measure how good these things are, even on an IOC basis? I, I think there is an inherent difficulty. Uh, I, I think I'll maybe give the two ends of the spectrum. Uh, sharing IOCs like MD5s and domain names is easier because it, it, these are artifacts that are globally, you know, mean the same for different organizations. Uh, but when you do um, when, when you do a, AI or behavioral um, analysis of of, uh, uh, of of an internal network, the specific result actually depends on the context of that specific network. And and sharing that information doesn't always help. Sometimes it, it can confuse others. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the inherent problems of uh, how to share information that relates to uh, to behavioral analysis or things that are not black or white. What are, are we getting better? Let me ask. So there's a lot of um, solutions and vendors and, and yeah, even academic projects that are doing a good job of trying to scrape deep dark web, open ascent, et cetera, for IOCs like those static IOCs you're mentioning, right? Um, are we getting better using NLP to try to get, I'm gonna, uh, I hate to use the word cognitive, it's one of my least favorite words, <laughs> um, but are we getting better at machines helping humans um, properly correlate data and put it into context better for us by drawing in timelines and news stories, <laughs> um, TLP red information. Like, are we doing good on machines or can we get better? Like, what's... Warning, you're going into vendor feature areas, right, and services. Um, I think everyone would say, we do it wonderfully, right? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but, but, but I think instead we should think of what are the, what are the context planes we want. Yeah. But, what is the external aggressor space or neutral space events? What is the information plane? What is the identity plane? What are the business processes that are affected? Those types of things when you bring in. So at first we want to remove noise, as Rafi <laughs> kind of was, I think, getting towards, right. and get that noise out of the system, get a far higher signal ratio in the data, and then signal to actionability. And in that second part, is where you start to bring that. So there's a human being, and yes, you can use machine learning to get the noise out, right. and yes, you can use machine learning to do correlation, but then you can also use it to bring in context to the point where they're examining it and trying to figure out the story or communicate it or make a decision. And I don't think enough that? has been done generally. I'll, I'll throw two okay. components into like what you just said in the end, right? Mm -hmm. Throwing the context in. A, actually, how many of you have a really good handle on the assets that you have on your <laughs> network. <laughs> Trick question. <laughs> Please We've been trying to hand. solve this problem for 20 years, yeah. right? Back then it was asset management tools. We hooked them up to our sims. We thought we we're gonna get a good asset inventory. Still today, barely anyone can tell me exactly what machines they have on the network. If you can't even tell me what you have on the network, what's your risk, what's happening, and so on. So, so that problem is still there. The second component, I've spent a lot of my career building open source tools and writing articles and books on security visualization. How do you take data and communicate that to people and make the data actionable and understandable to analysts? Yeah. We've talked about this topic for a long time. Look at the products out there. How horrible are they for incident responders, security analysts in the SOC, wherever you have to work, um, analyzing what's really happening, understanding very quickly their context and understanding cognitively, sorry for the word, um, what is actually happening in there, right? We are still, like, the tools are horrible. The methods are out there. It's not rocket science, but we just haven't built it because so, it's always the feature that's the last to be on the road. But by the way, we always want to design the perfect system, right? It's the CMDB that layers in the context perfectly. I, I think if in an operational sense, you, uh, you look at the process someone's trying to run and say, measure the efficiency of it, small gains matter. I don't have to build the Uber CMDB. I don't have to know where all the data is or which are all the account accesses. Right. Mm. But if you can start to just get a little faster or make it easier, less clicks for them to get to the data, you can, like, and it, what happens with an investigation? An incident comes across, okay, it's a true positive. Let's just assume that. So now how does a person tell the story of what happened before and after, how to wrap it up, what to do about it, and how to tell people? But now, if that takes that four hours... Why isn't that just, automated in this you know thing, what? right? I, I agree. Why isn't it? It's just as much of a moonshot kind of challenge as getting the perfect asset registry for a company. And that's been an IT problem for 30 years, as you just said. But if I can take it from four hours to three and a half, that's a benefit. And I don't have to have an Uber solution to do it. Uh, this, yeah. is, this is process refinement and waste removal. And I don't think we do enough of that in cyber in general. Yeah, IT's right. got it down, right? They do root cause analysis incredibly efficiently. Go ahead. Uh, supposedly. Yeah, right. I, I'd like to go back to one of the, the questions that, that you had started the discussion with here, which was, are we getting any better? And again, without going into vendor feature function, um, I think the answer is yes, that we don't want to sound too pessimistic here. 
And as a sort of public example, uh, DHS put out a video, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago now, uh, where they went through what they were doing in their SOC for the federal government, and they were they shown by using things like augmenting AI kinds of tools to human analysts and working together, you know, they're able to reduce their responses from you know many hours into minutes. And the point being, going back to their original argument, you know, what's driving a lot of this? Uh, most of what's happening out there that people are focused on is the cyber crime is an economic argument. And so the question is, can you respond faster and make it too costly in order for the adversary to come after you? Because it's never going to be perfect. And so it's how do you balance the economics of this? Not always work for, for nation states. I mean, yeah. China won't be quite as affected by the same kind of calculation that, say, uh, the, you know, the, the mafia types that are in Eastern Europe. But it's still um, uh, the, the focus of attention of trying to change the economics of it rather than looking for perfection in, in cybersecurity. OK. So let's, let's shift towards um, what, I, what I often think is the fun part of AI, which is um, you know, we, we are all s mostly cyber folks in the room. We have some data scientists, and this is an AI conference. So um, m going forward, what problems do we need to focus on, either within the field of AI in order to better have a solution that we need, or what problems, like we said at the beginning, I think you said it, right? Let's identify the, the problem first and then the tools to solve the problem. What are the problems that we can look at in the future and maybe use AI to solve for? I think maybe the most important is automating the, the SOC and, and um, changing the way that the SOC works. Because we, we all know today that uh, you know, there are too many alerts, too many events, and we, we you know, barely can, uh, can deal with a small portion of them. I think if we find the, the right recipe to, to leverage AI to, uh, you know, to completely change the game, and uh, you know, instead of just helping analysts to, to do a little better, maybe look at it on the other way around, or you know, to find a, a better way to, uh, to orchestrate the whole thing, I think that that would be the a huge difference. Do we like automation in SOC environments? For some things. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think to his point, it can lead and to incremental improvements. Yeah, and it can lead to those incremental improvements, right? So we might be going about it the wrong way right now. And so, I, I mean, I think we can, we can make our SOCs more efficient, and we can cut an hour off the time it takes to do an investigation, or take a minute off the time it takes to get through a 10-minute investigation. But each of those aren't changing you know, what we're actually looking for. And so I think, yeah, that's one theme is the noise reduction and process automation. And the other is novel detection, right? And finding the types of behaviors and attacks that are subverting all of the current approach that we're using. Because uh, that's the, the fun part of machine learning and security is that it is that adversarial situation, and the attackers understand exactly how most SOCs works, right? Uh, and so and uh, when you're well-resourced enough, you can find the, the ways to subvert those processes, right? So I think that's continuing to uh, keep ahead of how uh, or take the adversarial mindset and think about how they would get around the current uh, attacks in place or defenses in place, excuse me, uh, is, is where we need to be developing, right? And, and mm. continually coming up with novel detections and understanding how the current processes can be subverted. OK, so I'm hearing, I'm hearing SOC. I'm hearing detections. I'm hearing getting faster and better sure. uh, accuracy. Um, in, in the context of, let's say, the MITRE attack, um, attack for ATT and CK framework, um, uh, you know, it's very, very broad across 11 whatever tactics. Uh, we'll just think of the lucky kill chain left to right, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, the SOC is the bulk of this, the hard part of our, of our existence as security professionals and OPSEC, right? Is there, a, is there a way to shift the problem space more left be, and leverage AI? Or is there a way also to look at um, how you can find things after the fact, but then get it operationalized <laughs> quicker? So, so two things. One is an extrapolation of what was said here, which is I think we need to really think about metrics and efficiency and process improvement. The other is for the last 15 years or so, we've, this has been our attitude. So there's a, something called Locard's principle, right, which is in physical security, every time a, a crime is committed, there's an exchange of trace evidence between the criminal and crime team. That's why we do CSI. Mm -hmm. And what we've said is just get all the datas in a pile, and we'll figure it out after. And I don't trust you vendors. Give me the pile, I'll sort it out later. Well, that's proven really hard. Yeah. Being fast and smart at machine speed for every message that possibly has a security connotation, and then still be able to respond in real time, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It, it's like, imagine if you did a CS, imagine a crime was committed in here and this whole room became a CSI scene. And we're not just gonna look for fingerprints and dirt and blood samples and things like that. We're gonna go to the molecular level to record. Mm -hmm. I, I think the word that was said twice earlier and is really important is behavior. Yeah. Like, so behavior and better data structures. I, I'm not interested in classic sim dumping grounds. I'm not interested in the, in, in the every possible use case type of mining. So I, I'm both a cyber guy and a data scientist. How you prepare the data for use mm. and how you use memory really matters. If you have a query as an investigator and you enter some question, or maybe an ML gives you suggestion, breadcrumbs of what to ask, mm. and you have to wait any appreciable time, your brain's off the task. That's right. You have to be able to reach through the tool, no more special snowflake tools, no matter who makes them, and, and play with the security data. And when you get to that point, and I believe that the root of that is behavioral data organized better. Mm. I don't care if it's network or endpoint. I don't believe, care if it's inferred from and put in another data structure from a SIM, right? Like we've done with flow for network traffic. We could do the log kind of equivalent. We can learn from past I'm data. I'm right? much more interested in, so how do we get better data sets and how does that meet up with better process management? Yeah, and actually careful. Um, what you just said, we have historic data to look at things. And that, this yeah, is one of my dangerous. pet peeves, right? It's like there's a whole world out there that's trying to describe the future based on, on the past. It's also called the stock market. Um, but it's <laughs> they don't need to know the Egyptian price of commodity 3,000 years ago to do it, <laughs> right? Valuable well, lesson, but, but not that's in what your we're data security, set. right? We're looking at the past behavior and we try to infer what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, but that's, guess what? That's, we're going to be surprised but, every single day. But right? you just described the whole field of everything. Everything. Yeah. So exactly. we're either in well, it or we're... Well, well, it's how much it generalizes. Yeah, because I think that's, that's uh, right. attack framework is fantastic and it's a compendium of everything we know so far, right? It's also a great uh, blacklist for attackers to, not, exactly <laughs> right. to not do, right? And that's and, why what also Sam was saying, right? Like moving on sort of to behaviors or how do I care characterize what is normal. Yep. And again, it's, it doesn't have to be that it's like, you have, the, like Rafi behaves exactly like this all the time, right? I'm at a conference right, right now using a public Wi-Fi that you would probably flag normally because normally I work from home in my secure mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. Like, like, but you have to draw boundaries somewhere. Right? Yeah. I'm and curious we're... really quick, just qu quick show of hands. How many people are, are operationalizing MITRE ATT&CK? And have that, okay, so I'm gonna say four, five percent. Six <laughs> percent. Okay. Yeah, okay. Just, just to curiosity, keep going. A lot of the vendors. I, I mean, I think it's a good foundation, right? But how well uh, it, we're, we, it, it, it can get us too focused on particular signatures of known attacks that don't generalize well to future attacks, right? And so, capturing the data, I think, and the business risk and internal risk that our customers face is much more about how the data moves and how the data leaves the network, right? What tool was used? Uh, it's interesting to know and important forensically, but it doesn't uh, help me actually solve my core problem. And you said something very important. In the end, if I'm a little ignorant, I could say that I don't really care all the stuff you do on your devices and all this, the stuff your devices do automatically because they might be compromised, right? That's some hygiene question and so on. Mm -hmm. In the end, what I really care about is when my critical data is being touched, where that data goes, whether the integrity is, is, is guaranteed, and then maybe some availability things in, in certain areas, right? Like machines need to be available, servers and so on. But when it comes to data, when you have to monitor when your users are accessing your critical data and how they're accessing and what they're doing with it. If you start profiling that, you're not profiling the whole world. Mm. You're profiling something very specific that you can actually, you might have a chance to succeed. By the way, I, I, I do want to give a little PSA on the attack framework. Um, several of us up here have been evaluating it, and it's not about us. Mm -hmm. Like, the biggest mistake, I think, is that everyone's trumpeting it like it was an EDR, MDR test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in fact not. It uplevels the game in how to do incident response. And I've had, I had a call, two colleagues of mine, uh, both CISOs, one said, so can I use this for red teaming? And another one said, so can I use this for POCs? I said, sure, but why don't you use it for purple teaming? And why don't you use it to find out, you know, not in an adversarial way or like one play in a basketball game, why don't you actually use it to figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are and then use that to go and figure out what you need rather than have six vendors scream they did the best at it. So it's a, it ends up being a framework for dialogue and introspection it, rather than testing. Yeah, internally, yeah. and a framework for turning the art of how your level three analyst turned into a human 
you know, detection anomaly spotter right. and turning it into a science for the That's department. Good. But risk adjusted, I think, is the an important missing piece, right? Right now, it's yes. a, it's approach weighted, right? Yep. Just by the number of things in a column, and so we focus too much on the approach. And Actually, not, not uh, where Josh Salonis is. started to do some other ways at Forrester of saying how are these things being correlated into less messages? Yep. And so he puts his Python scripts up on Git. You can download them and see them and run them, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't come out with a one-to-end score of who the best vendor is, yeah. right? It should, you should be able to look at it and say, well, my program I analyzed using it this way. I need something like this. Let me go look at all the options. The value of MITRE ATT&CK is exactly this dialogue we're having. So if you're not familiar with it or using it, we would probably all encourage you at least to use it as a framework to dialogue and message inside the company and with your vendors, et cetera. But don't use it for a, a test framework yeah. to test I mean, You can also do we that, all agree? but yeah. that's not its purpose. And that's right. they're starting a program on prevalence as well, so that yeah. you can understand what attacks are out there and at what levels, right? And so that, that is, a, I think, a helpful way to lead towards the risk-adjusted. OK, so we're going to pivot more closely towards the, the future of AI. Let me see. Check the time. Uh, it's 11.07. So we have probably, what, 10 minutes? Nine minutes? seconds. Oh, we well, have nine seconds. It's right there in front of me. <laughs> Maybe there's Six, supposed to be questions. Five. Yeah, five. Um, yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's, we have one question about AI from the audience that you want to ask this panel. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> It looks like a bomb going off. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, earlier on, you were talking about the difference between AI and ML. And in that mix, I was wondering if IoT fit in there. Is it, has it <laughs> I think any related value? And what are the similarities and differences? That was one question. The other question is, we're talking about how AI is out there in um, the environment and how we can leverage it to control data, how to manage data. And each of you were sort of one-upping the other, saying, I disagree, I have a better control and a better control. But then I decided to disagree with all of you, because I don't think you discussed the topic of how once the AI or the algorithm or the code that we're sending out into the environment is then controlled. How do we, having sent that out, what controls, what means do we have to make sure that that code or algorithm we've sent out is doing what it's meant to do and not creating havoc in the environment that we've sent it out to. So let's, let's do this. First question, uh, let's just say that IoT brings with it a wealth of streaming data. And that will, AI is well, well positioned to help understand that data in a, in a massive streaming contest, if that makes sense. Um, and then let's pivot to your second question. And it's, it's, it's a really good question, actually. So you deploy AI. What kind of control do you delegate to, uh, to, the, to the user of the AI to both feel empowered? Because we didn't really cover that. We wanted to. Um, but you know, feel empowered, but also um, be able to exercise control, back it off if they need to, et cetera. I think a starting point is measurement. And so uh, understanding what your goals were when you deployed it, and then measuring the, continually measuring the efficacy. Because all these things are living systems that are uh, uh, adapting. You need to be tracking uh, you know, what the efficacy is on a day-to-day -day basis, and if it's achieving the outcomes you want, or what harm it may be causing. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to say, like, I, I'm going to infer it sounded like the person who asked the question thought that somehow we're releasing an autonomous thinking machine into the environment. And we're really not, mm -hmm. right? So um, you can think of it at different tiers. At the machine level, what we're usually doing is coming up with a slightly better mousetrap of what already exists. Mm -hmm. It's not a thinking processing machine that has autonomy in what it can do. It's a better AV. It's a better blocker. It's a better allower, right, uh, yeah, for the known good. goods. Yeah. But then at the aggregation level is what most of us, I think, we're talking about. What is it doing on the back end to help with incident response specifically? <laughs> and that's not a distributed uh, machine learning algorithm or AI. To your point, uh, even with the IoT or mm. any other device that's feeding data, we're just getting more of it and richer data and bigger feedback to do bigger calculations. Yeah. And those, that's two very different things. So I would throw in a couple more comments. The first is, I don't know that the question is unique or special to, MI, to AI or ML, that when you put any piece of software or any hardware device um, in your car or in your house, you know, how do you know that you can trust it and what it's doing? It depends on, on uh, the context as to how much you want to do and how much you want to investigate. The usual path that people look for confidence is explainability. And so when the system tells you something and you'd want to know whether it's creating havoc or not, you might ask it, why did you get to this? And it's hard to do, right? 
And By the way, it's hard to do with maybe one, one recommendation. Is, I was thinking the same thing. But. Maybe one recommendation that I have based on uh, you know uh, socks and, and cyber analysts that I've seen. Typically, the first they ask uh, how how did that system got to that conclusion. So they ask that question many times. But actually, this is not the most relevant question because you know in the end of the day, you're not. Uh, it's not about analyzing the vendor's product. It's really about uh, about the the cybersecurity case and whether or not it's uh, it's a real case or uh, what do you need to do about it. So I, I think in, when you adopt a technology, uh, I think the, the best adoption is when you uh, learn to trust the technology. And of course, it's limitation also. Um, and deal mostly with the cybersecurity problem that, that you're trying to solve and really you know, try to, uh, to assess what's the risk of, of, you know, of the different cases and how deep you want to, to go into investigating them. But don't investigate the machine. Investigate the cyber <laughs> cases. And if, if it doesn't give you any value, just you know, toss it and, and get another vendor. I, I, I sensed the automotive question there rather than the security one, and so I just have a, a question for folks. If there's 40,000 or so deaths a year due to car accidents in the U.S., All human cars. and we could automate overnight and have only 50 a year, but you'd never know why, mm -hmm. would you do it? Well, but show of hands. Who would do that bet? I would. <laughs> you don't get to know. You just get to look at the data afterwards, and maybe it'll improve over time. Okay, good. So um, now turn to the person next to you and say, I still don't know what AI is. <laughs> <laughs> because no two data scientists, even the best in the world, will agree on what AI is or isn't yet. So a uh, round of applause for our panelists who did a marvelous job. We do have time for a couple more questions, if okay. you like. 100%. Are there any more questions? We can also talk after. There's one over here. This one better be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the time of talking. Um, hi. Uh, I'm not sure who to direct this to. Well, let's see. There's a couple of people there. Um, let's see. So let's go back to the Hackham's thing. I tried implementing that where I worked a few years ago. Um, and it was too complicated and difficult for the people to understand. I mean, the guaranteed assured aspect, you know, and stuff like that. They kind of got that in intermediate part. But the, the process was a little bit too, too arcane for them to get. Uh, and they were always concerned about, okay, so at CMU, for example, you, you have the repository of all that stuff. They said, well, is it really free and stuff? And, well, there was that. So, Bottom line is, there's also concerns, and I had this mentioned this to the former guy, his name was John Launchbury, who used to be in charge of hacking before he handed over Ray Richards. And, and the key concern is the fact that formal methods have a limitation in the way they scale. And that's important because that means all bets are off at a certain threshold. When you get complex adaptive systems, which is what I call AI, Chaos. you know, it changes it more. You can't necessarily use the formal methods in that. The only thing you can do is containerize it, you know, like in a Linux container or something like that, where you can say, I am guaranteeing that it will behave within this particular range. And whatever it does, it's not going to cause any damage outside of it, like putting a kid in a sandbox. So, so scalability. Yeah, the scalability oh, so. is a big concern. Let's speak to that. So what, yeah. who's got experience? We have a, but we have a bad habit in security of saying it's either perfect or broken. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and I would say, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But we seem to have the sense if I could just get every machine secure, then I could stick them all together and the network would be secure. And if I could do that, I could stick them all together and the internet would be secure. Mm. Uh, I, I really want to get away from the perfection fetish, right? So I hear exactly what you're saying. but. Look for where you can get incremental improvements. Um, that has value. Like we can't build perfect buildings. It doesn't mean we don't build buildings. That's right. And I would even maybe throw one more component into this, which is even at small scale, how do you trust what's happening? So what I'm seeing often right now, and I call this a little bit of the, the dangers of AI, is that I, you have programmers, maybe even data scientists that, are, that should know better, you download an algorithm from the internet, a library, right? Whatever, like TensorFlow or whatever you want. And you run your data through it, and you get output from it. And it's like, oh my god, this is what's going on. This is now the gospel, right? The problem is, you have no idea what the thing just did. A lot of algorithms, you have to understand what the data distribution is that you're putting in there. They don't work on any kind of data. A lot of algorithms, you have to tune parameters. The way you tune them 
will completely change how the algorithm creates output. And there's devastating results you get if you don't understand what these parameters are. But you're running it through it, and you just you see the output, and you're like, oh, this is what it is. And then you make decisions based on that. And that is dangerous. Yeah, because cats dangerous. can become avocados. And we've seen this, these, these you know, small and, and anomalies. There, there you can verify it, right? Yes. There I can easily look at it and like, oh my god, it's obviously wrong. Right. But as we keep discussing here, right, there's a lot of algorithms you can't look inside the box. It gives you output. The car makes a right turn, or it doesn't. You don't know why. But who knows that the algorithm was actually applied in the right way, mm. right? And if you have to make decisions that, are, that lives depend on in whatever systems, that can be very small systems where you use some machine learning to do something. Honest question, what percent of the human population is capable of analyzing the AI they're using at that level of, of pragmatic fidelity, for lack of better words? What percentage would you there's, say? There's, there's a few dozen people in the world that can probably do it. I don't know. That's right. And how many people understand the drugs they take or the food they eat? Right? They still trust through that, right? That's true. So it's a good counterpoint. But there's, um, there's tests, right? There, yeah. To coming back, right? There's a, there's a you method. You still have a right to ask a couple of questions. Yeah. 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 That's good. Excellent. Any other last minute questions? We have one more. Let's we'll do it. We'll do a quick round because I saw our stand up right after I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Sorry about this. Um, it sounds like what you guys are talking about a lot is that there's a need for somebody to come in and say this is an algorithm that looks at what you're doing inside that black box and takes in all the input, the context, the data, the models, everything, and then kind of gives you a digestible output. Do you think that something like that makes sense or is that something people are actually already, I know that there's pieces of that being worked on. I've heard a lot of kind of talks about various things. It's something that I've been passionate about for a couple of years now for sure. I'm uh, trying to figure it out. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. It's, it. The problem is that we have this, I use the same word, yeah. fetish, with deep learning, right? Which is yeah. supervised machine learning. You can't really look inside of the box, so you can't explain it. Go back 20 years or, or even maybe more, there's algorithms out there that are perfectly explainable. Belief networks, we don't talk about them. They're amazing tools to capture expert knowledge and, and model expert something. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 you can look inside, and it's completely explainable. So. Deep learning, amazing, like malware identification, the, the, incredible, right? Huge accuracy, speech recognition, yeah. like image recognition, all these kinds of things, amazing. But for certain areas, it's just not the right thing. And we have this like, idea that AI or deep learning is Running just through. a panacea for everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think I encourage people to look wider. What's the right approach? By the way, in business, AI is being used really successfully in journalism, maybe questionable results, but in, in legal. <laughs> the paralegal job has changed, mm -hmm. right? Um, the business benefits are really understandable in most of our businesses. Hmm. But security is still not aligned all that well. Hmm. And I would say most of them are not that far advanced. But uh, you know what? I think the, the fact that so many companies are doing experiments here and so many companies are interested because we, we still lose the security problem, which is bad guys tend to win more. As long as that's true, innovation can, can fill the gap and try to change the game, whether it's met by a ML or AI or anything else. Excellent. Thank you guys so much again. Big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.